Hello dear student, welcome to the next lecture in tensor analysis. So far we have learned about tensor algebra and about tensor notations. So this was just an introduction about what is coming over. In tensor algebra, we just dealt with a few tensors that is maybe a two or three tensors and how they interact with each other or how they can be combined to map to some spaces or how they actually act in a space, how they are related to each other, how they can be predicted, uh, taken, uh, multiplied, how they can be added up. So these are coming in tensor algebra. So we are dealing only with a handful of tensors. Now we are stepping on to tensor calculus. In tensor calculus, instead of getting uh, acquainted, uh, getting uh, dealt with uh, two or three tensors, we are here actually dealing with tensor fields. So tensor field is an infinite collection of tensors where tensors can be changed every point in space. We are familiar with tensor fields such as electric field, that is a field generated around an electric charge, a magnetic field, a gravitational field in Newton's law, it's a tensor field. So we come across different tensor fields and now in tensor calculus, we want to know how these vectors or how this tensor field actually acts in different circumstances. So let me give you a brief uh, idea about what a field is. You are familiar with scalar fields. Here given in the picture is a temperature field. You know that temperature is a scalar. So here the blue dots uh, denotes uh, low temperature and the red spots denote higher temperature. So if you have a different spots such as here in the blue spot say it is negative 1, here in the red spot say it is 2, etc. If you have these numbers independently, then they are called scalars. But these scalars now are represented as a function of x and y coordinates. That is, they are related to some kind of a function. So this particular space in which these scalars are related to some kind of a function, they are, these scalars are not related uh, to some other coordinates of the space, then it is called a scalar field. Similarly, a tensor field or a tensor point function is said to be defined when the tensors of the given space are defined by a function. Therefore, the components of the tensors uh, in this case will be the functions of the coordinates x, y, z or r, theta, phi, whatever it may be. Now, since this is tensor calculus, here the variations are uh, taken in terms of derivatives or integrals as we have done calculus in our elementary classes. Similarly, to deal with the tensors over here, we come across a lot of derivatives and integrals. So far in tensor algebra, we have learned about covariant tensors or covariant vectors. But in tensor calculus, we will be dealing with covector fields. In tensor algebra, we talk about metric tensors. We will talk about it in a, a few slides. So we talk about metric tensor. Consider metric tensor as something which we use to measure the length or an angle, something like a scalar product in algebra. While in tensor calculus, we have to deal with metric tensor fields. In tensor algebra, we deal with coordinate transformation, such as we transform from the Cartesian coordinate uh, to polar coordinate. Here the uh, uh, basis vectors in the Cartesian coordinate as well as in the polar coordinate are constants. So we just uh, need to transform those uh, components. Uh, the basis vectors remains the same. But in the case of tensor calculus, the, the geometry of the space is quite different such that we have to deal with the changes in the basis vectors also. So instead of having fixed spaces to change the vectors from one to another, 
here we have the coordinate transformation changing from point to point in the space so instead of having single uh, uh, transformation here we deal with transformation basis vectors uh, which are uh, changing from point to point tensor calculus come in handy while we are dealing with uh, the relativity we are familiar with the faraday tensor in a uh, relativistic electromagnetism the faraday tensor allows us to combine both the electric and the magnetic field into one single tensor field Similarly, we have uh, learned about Cauchy's stress tensor a few videos earlier. This will help us study the variation of stress in uh, continuous solids. And also, this uh, tensor calculus helps in uh, find the variation of the metric tensor. We will learn about metric tensor in general relativity. Uh, uh, for now, just uh, think about it as it will uh, give us an idea how the energy and momentum changes from point to point in a space in case of general relativity. So in this video, we will be learning about metric tensor, the Christoffel symbols and how to evaluate Christoffel symbols as the derivative of the metric tensor. Then we will learn about covariant derivative and how to evaluate it and also about geodesic and parallel transport. So let us learn about a metric tensor. Consider a manifold. Here we have given a manifold which is embedded on a spherical surface. So, the surface of this given sphere is the manifold and it is a two-dimensional manifold which is embedded on a three-dimensional uh, space that is sphere. Just uh, like a globe. Uh, you have a globe on your home and all the uh, countries which are embedded. It is a two-dimensional sheet which is embedded on a three-dimensional space. So manifold here I mean is a two-dimensional manifold which is embedded on a three-dimensional spherical uh, uh, space. So every point on a manifold has its own tangent space. So here we uh, what is shown is the tangent space according uh, to different points on a manifold. And this tangent space is a linear vector space and n-dimensional Euclidean space. So every point on a manifold can be mapped to an n-dimensional Euclidean space and that is known as its tangent space. So every uh, vector in this tangent space uh, can be connected to the vectors in the tangent space of the other points such that we can make a relationship between the points in the manifold. And uh, those kind of connection, we come across different types of connection in which we can connect the points in the manifold. Uh, and one such type of connection which involves the tangent spaces of the manifold is called a metric tensor. A metric tensor is a bilinear function. A bilinear function is something which connects uh, uh, vectors of elements from two different spaces and give us a result in a different space other than these two different spaces. So uh, consider metric tensor as some kind of a measuring device which measures uh, say distance or angle between any two points in the manifold. So this metric tensor is a bilinear function. It, it connects the elements from one tangent space to the other tangent space and give us a, a result which is outside these tangent spaces. And here in the case of a Riemannian manifold, this metric tensor actually gives us the distance between the points in the manifold or the angle between two vectors in the manifold. So consider metric tensor as a type of function which takes in input as a pair of tangent vectors, say V and W, at some point on the surface, which is a higher dimensional manifold 
and it produces as a real number a scalar which is a distance or an angle a metric tensor is used to define the length or the angle between two tangent vectors metric tensor is something like a scalar product dot product we know using dot product we can measure the magnitude of a vector and also angle between two vectors this is uh, the uh, use of metric tensor in tensor algebra but here in uh, tensor calculus we have to come to uh, metric tensor fields so these field actually allows us to measure the length and the angle between the tangent vectors the metric tensor allows us to define compute the length of the manifold in different manifolds so now let us try to define the metric tensor or try to derive an uh, mathematical uh, background for the metric tensor see here in cartesian coordinate system while we are dealing with cartesian coordinate system we said the covariant and the contravariant vectors doesn't make much sense in the cartesian coordinate they are almost the same in the cartesian coordinate system so uh to find uh, or to derive an expression for the metric tensor we need to go to a generalized coordinate system uh, which is not like cartesian coordinate in cartesian coordinate the problem was all the h parameters are one uh, so we will go to some generalized coordinates uh, for the time being say uh, we can deal with a generalized coordinate of a polar coordinate a polar coordinate is also an orthonormal coordinate uh, but uh, different from the cartesian space such as its h parameters are uh, h parameters are not one so here i consider a uh, uh, general coordinate system say qi and this general coordinate system can be expressed uh, as a function of the euclidean space you know that because uh, we have expressed polar coordinates in cartesian coordinates say uh, x is equal to r cos theta y is equal to r sin theta etc so uh, these coordinates can be related to one another so one can be expressed in terms of the other so here i express x i s in terms of the uh, new cartesian uh, new coordinates generalized coordinates q1 q2 and q3 remember these general coordinates need not be orthonormal uh, orthogonal need not be normalized uh, need not have h parameters as one so it is just a generalized coordinate with all type of ambiguities which you can imagine now uh, we can differentiate one coordinate xi with respect to the um, generalized coordinate using linear transformation law this can be uh, differentiated as dxi is equal to do xi by do qj into dqj here xi's all the xi's can be um, uh, comprised into dr and say dr is equal to uh, uh, dqj into its basis vectors so here this form a vector this is a vector and this is a vector uh, this is its a uh, component dqj are components in the eg transformation such that uh, we write some vector a is equal to a1x1 plus a2x2 etc here these dqjs are components and these epsilon j are the uh basis vectors but these epsilon j basis vectors are not the basis vectors of a cartesian coordinate but these uh basis vectors can be functions of positions so that they can be expressed in terms of cartesian coordinate such as it is do xi by do qj it is ej therefore ei can be expressed by uh since uh both uh these are uh, sorry uh since uh, we have a uh, uh, dummy parameters we can add it over do xi by do qi ex dash do xy by do qi ey dash and do x z by do qi ez dash so here some uh, since this is not an orthogonal coordinate system 
This is an n-dimensional non-orthogonal coordinate system. Therefore, EI can be uh, this uh, can be commonly written by using uh, the Einstein summation convention as EI is equal to do R by do QI, which is somewhat equal to EI if the h parameters are equal to one. So, if the h parameters are also not equal to 1, that is, if Eis are not normalized, then Ei is equal to Hi Ei, such that, uh, for example, in uh, Cartesian to polar coordinate system, we know that R cap, that is, Er, uh, can be expressed and also E theta is equal to r of and also e phi have an h parameter epsilon phi will have an h parameter r sin theta e theta here similarly e phi and this is e r so it varies according to the h parameter if it, they are not normalized now consider an arbitrary vector uh, this arbitrary vector can be written as a linear combination of its covariant coefficients multiplied by, uh, sorry, contravariant coefficients ai multiplied by its covariant coefficients epsilon i. So, we are defining a vector in our generalized coordinate system with epsilon i as the basis vectors. So, a can be written as a product of ai ei. So, AI and EI both changes equally such that to keep A fixed. Uh, I have said uh, here we encounter with changes in epsilon I also. Not, uh, not just the components changes, uh, the basis vector also changes. So, here AI and EI changes mutually so as to keep A fixed. So, the distance to measure distance between any two points in QI, we have to take uh, consider a distance parameter ds and take its uh, dot product. See, uh, we have a manifold and we are measuring distance from this point to this point. So, this is our curve and we have to uh, find the distance of this curve. So, this curve actually consists of a multiple of tangent vectors at those points. So, uh, if this tangent vector, to measure one tangent vector, consider one origin. Take this position vector, consider this position vector and change its difference. This difference is dr. If the position vector is dr, with respect to some other parameter, d lambda will give you the tangent vector ds. Similarly, by adding over or integrating over this curve along all the tangent vectors, you will give you will get the distance of this entire curve. So, to find the distance of the entire curve, it is necessary for you to find the uh, actual distance of this vector. So, to find the magnitude of the vector ds, we have to find, take the dot product of ds. So, this is the infinitesimal change in the uh, general coordinate qi. So, ds, modulus of ds is equal to ds dot ds. In case here, we can dot with dr. So, changing dr, we know that dr is expressed as dqi ei or dqj ej since dqis and dqjs are components we take a dot product with ei dot ej here listen ei dot ej cannot be delta ig we know that in cartesian coordinate we take ei dot ej or in any other orthogonal coordinate system ei dot ej is equal to delta ig since this is not an orthogonal coordinate system and essentially not a normalized coordinate system, we cannot consider this dot product to be delta function. So, this dot product actually gives us some 
other function which is a metric which is a covariant metric of uh, a rank 2 and this covariant metric of rank 2 is called covariant metric tensor this covariant metric tensor allows us to measure the distance between two points in the manifold we know that ds is a scalar this is invariant under transformation that is uh, even under rotation or reflection ds remains uh, constant that is here we have a scalar if this is a scalar uh, with respect to the quotient rule which uh, we have learned in our previous video we know that with respect to quotient rule if you have two upper integers and two lower integers the result will be a scalar uh, if you have one upper integers and one lower integers the result will be a scalar if you have two upper integers and one uh, lower integers the result will be a contravariant vector if you uh, multiply uh, similarly it depends on the number of integers you have here so here you have two uh, upper integers and the result is a scalar therefore you have this gij must be a tensor of rank 2 therefore ei are non orthonormal coordinate and uh, gi is symmetric but not diagonal if EY, ei were orthogonal coordinates system then we will have gi to be diagonal uh, we have this gij that is covariant metric tensor diagonal in our minkowski space uh, that is the space where we define special relativity but it is not a diagonal in uh, the general relativity space the Riemannian the pseudo Riemannian manifold this is not a diagonal metric so gij is uh, by definition is a symmetric tensor but it is not uh, essentially a diagonal tensor in every manifold also uh, gij has a characteristic such as gik into gkj uh, can be uh, defined as delta ij also gij uh, can be multiplied with uh, gkj this can be uh, reversed also so this is of the form a a inverse is equal to a inverse a that is equal to i or delta ij so the metric tensor is an invertible tensor so let us find the applications of metric tensor the metric tensors help us in converting covariant vectors to contravariant vector Sim, uh, consider the, here we have a contravariant component of a vector fj this fj can be converted to a covariant component by just multiplying it with the metric tensor so using the quotient rule the metric tensor gives us this j uh, uh, g i j multiplied with f j will give you a covariant component similarly a contravariant basis vector can be converted to a covariant basis vector by multiplying it with the uh, it with a metric tensor similarly uh, covariance can be converted to contravariance as well in case of uh, components or in case of basis vectors so if a vector is represented as a contravariant uh, vector in one field it is possible for us to define it as a contravariant tensor also using this Suppose we have a covariant uh, tensor here it is defined as AI EI sorry the contravariant tensor so uh, we can uh, this will not change if I multiply a delta vector here so that it is delta IK we know that delta IK 
can be replaced by a combination of two uh, metric tensors that is gig and also gik so gig into gik actually gives us the delta tensor so this can be split into gij uh, the covariant form and gik and jk the contravariant form this gij uh, operating on the contravariant component ai will give you the covariant component aj and also this gjk uh, uh, operating on the basis vector epsilon k uh, will give you a contravariant basis vector that is ej therefore a vector can be represented either as a covariant or a contravariant form just by multiplying it with the metric tensor also consider when we were taking the scalar uh, product the dot product of two contravariant vectors in if ai and uh, if a and b are contravariant vectors say it is a i b j what we will do we will actually uh, we, uh, in uh, before also we have discussed this uh, if it is contravariant tensors it will come in the form of two uh, uh, column matrices so it is our duty to convert this column matrix the b to take the transform of b such that it will become a row matrix so to take the transform or change it into a row matrix so what we are doing here well, here we have a metric which is defined in the tangent space we are uh, taking it into its cotangent space to taking it into a cotangent space the better way is to multiply it with the metric tensor so we multiply b j e j uh, operate it with the metric tensor that is we will give similarly such that here we will give a delta uh, and then split it and afterwards it can be converted into a covariant form bj ej now it is possible for us to take dot product and the answer is ai bj so in uh, Minkowski uh, tensor, which I have been uh, talking about, the Minkowski tensor uh, here in Minkowski space Gij and Gji, that is the reciprocal of the metric tensor are also the same. This is not the same in every case. For example, if we are converting from the Cartesian coordinate to polar coordinate, Gij will give you a 3 by 3 metric. G, J, I will give you a 3 by 3 metric, but these both are different from one another. But in the case of Minkowski metric tensor, that is uh, the space where we define the special relativity, this is a constant space. That is G, I, J and its reciprocal G, I, J are both equal to one another. But in the case of general relativity, you know how this uh, tensor look in Minkowski space. Gij is equal to Gij. It is a 4 by 4 tensor only with uh, diagonal elements minus 1, minus 1, minus 1 and the rest of those are 0. So this is our uh, tensor. So taking the reciprocal of this will also give you the same. But in the case of general relativity, the Gij is not uh, equal to its reciprocal as well as it is not a diagonal metric. In uh, the general relativity Riemannian space, the Gij is also a four by uh, four uh, tensor Gij. What we hear is say G00, G01 up to G. 0 3 and here we have g 3 3 with all other elements so every point has its own uh, values sometimes it uh, some of these values may go to zero these values depends upon how much energy or momentum is present in that uh, in the local area local region of that point in the manifold so some of these uh, 
components can go to zero but uh, this is essentially not a diagonal metric uh, it, but it is a symmetric metric but it is essentially not a diagonal metric and its uh, reciprocal is uh, different Re uh, that is its contra uh, contravariant uh, form its contangent form is essentially different in the general relativity so uh, here the symmetric tensor gives us a major idea about uh, what happens in the manifold about the geometry of the manifold or about how much uh, information is contained in every point in the manifold if the metric tensor is a positive definite that is every uh, point in these uh, 0 0 0 1 everything is positive then it is called a Riemannian manifold uh, remember in general relativity we are working with pseudo Riemannian manifold so it there can be uh, 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 components which are not positive definite also so if this positive definite then the space is called a Riemannian manifold when a metric tensor is available uh, we have the concept we have an idea which is related to the shape of the manifold we uh, uh, in that case in the case of metric tensor we talk about tangent spaces and cotangent space so metric tensor actually allows us to carry operations in tangent space and maybe map it to cotangent space or in the reverse so uh, we have connection between the tangent space and the cotangent space using the metric tensor so it is uh, mainly related tied up to the uh, concept of shape of the manifold uh, if it is a uh, spherical or every manifold has its own uh, metric tensor uh, so far i have talked only about um, the spherical one which i have shown earlier there can be many other shapes also so the metric tensor actually gives us an idea about the shape it actually relates to the shape of the manifold now let us move on to the another representation that is crystal symbols in case of metric tensor i said the connections are established in such a way that elements from two different tangent spaces are uh, connected together or uh, taken as function it's a bilinear function and we get result in another Euclidean or any other n-dimensional space if there is a not a metric tensor available and we need to or suppose we need to have the answers to be plotted on the manifold itself then such type of connections uh, we get using a, a metric connection such type of connections are called a metric connection a metric connection is a subset of an affine connection we will talk about affine connection in a few lectures from here so uh, for now just uh, think of it as affine connection connects the nearby tangent spaces so that it permits the tangent vectors to be differentiable as it is the functions inside the manifold that is we do not need a reference to an external manifold a metric connection is a specialization of this affine connection to the surfaces or any other manifold entered with a metric this allows distances to be measured on that surface itself on that manifold itself so the Christopher symbols are an array of numbers it's just an array of numbers it's not a tensor remember uh, if it is uh, even though it is represented it look like a mixed uh, tensor it is not it is just an array of numbers and it uh, describes the metric connection so metric connection is different from the metric tensor we uh, discussed uh, right now uh, metric tensor actually uh, uh, defines on a bundle of tensors a tensor bundle which uh, can be projected to another space so metric connection actually gives us uh, the result we get is included in this manifold itself 
So Christopher symbols actually gives us an array of numbers describing the metric tensor. Christopher symbols provide a uh, provide a concrete representation of the connection between uh, uh, two points uh, in the pseudo Riemannian geometry in terms of the coordinate of that manifold itself. The concepts uh, such as parallel transport, geodesic, we will come to that later, all these can be expressed in terms of Christopher symbols. Christopher symbols are used in performing practical calculations. Example we can talk about is the Riemannian uh, curvature tensor can be expressed entirely in terms of Christopher symbols and their partial derivatives. It uh, describes the gravitational force field or any other force field in general relativity. You must note that if the system and the coordinate, uh, the uh, system and the metric uh, share the same coordinates or share some symmetry, then the Christopher symbol goes to zero. Example of this is our Cartesian system. Here the Cartesian system, the tangent spaces and the Euclidean space and our general space both are the same. So here uh, the measurement taken using a metric tensor will definitely reside inside that coordinate system only. So it shares a symmetry. So if the coordinate system and the metric uh, shares a symmetry, then uh, the Christopher symbols in that cases goes to zero. So now let us evaluate uh, uh, the uh, mathematical form of Christopher symbols. Uh, let us differentiate a scalar psi in the new uh, coordinate system so that d psi is equal to dou psi by dou qi into dqi using linear transformation. Here dqi are the components of a covariant uh, vector. Here, uh, see, uh, dou psi by dou qi actually forms a basis. So, dqi is a component of a contravariant vector and the partial derivatives dou psi by dou qi must be a contravariant, covariant vector. We know that when we take a psi or a scalar function which is being differentiated, here we have a combination. See, uh, both these are dummy indices. So, d psi can be represented as a sum of three or more terms. If it is three dimensional, it will come as uh, in the form uh, psi 1 uh, dq1, psi 2 dq2, psi 3 dq3. So, this is, this is actually a form of a vector. So, what we have here is a vector. So, essentially what we have here is also a vector. And when we differentiate a scalar, what we get is a vector. So, if this is a vector, then dou psi by dou qi must form the covariant basis vector uh, in uh, using the quotient rule. Since this is contravariant, this must be covariant. So the gradient here we just differentiated so we can define gradient of a scalar del psi can be defined as dou psi by dou qi in the basis vector general basis vector ei. So dou psi by dou qi are not the gradient components since uh, epsilon i is a node equal to ei we know that this is not an orthonormal coordinate system so uh, uh, even though it appears this appears to be components of ei but ei itself has its own uh, expansion we know that ei can be expanded in terms uh, epsilon i can be expanded in terms of ei so this essentially cannot be the component of this gradient. Similarly, uh, consider the transformation of a vector. 
if uh, we transform a vector uh, from the coordinate system xi to qi we know that since it's a contravariant vector can be transformed as in the form dou xi by dou qa will give you the contravariant vector in the new uh, coordinate system now differentiate this vector if we differentiate that is by taking dou by dou qg you will have these components here this uh, both have to be differentiated uh, twice uh, such that uh, the product of these have to be taken so first of all we differentiate vk then we will differentiate this uh, term dou by dou xi so here we know that this seems familiar because uh, this gives you a transformation uh, that is a contravariant transformation here we have a tensor we know that but this term uh, seems not much familiar because here we have a quadratic term so uh, this is different from the transformation law of a second rank tensor so uh, what we hear here uh, we said that this cannot be the components in uh, del psi we said dou psi by dou qg cannot be the components of ei similarly we have to say that here this uh, we have a differentiation so this can also cannot be considered as a component the solution can be written in a single vector form just by substituting ei is equal to uh, as we have uh, done a few uh, slides earlier we can take epsilon i as dou xk by dou qi a combination of x k's we have done it earlier so just by substituting this we can rewrite this equation as dou vi by dou qj into epsilon i plus vi into dou by dou qj of epsilon i so this is the equation which we have right now therefore dou epsilon i by dou qj the term over here must be some linear combination of ek here we have some linear combination of the basis vector epsilon i and we know that vi is a linear combination of epsilon vector uh, the basis vector so this should also be some linear combination of ek then only it can be added together so this must also be some linear combination of the basis vector ek so this term uh, so we define a coefficient which depends on the indices i j and k i j because this term itself de uh, depends on i and j since this is to be written as a combination of e k we have k also so the coefficient must uh, depend on i j and k such a coefficient here we have capital gamma and this symbol gamma i j k is called the Christopher symbol of second kind we will come to first kind in a few moments so this uh, the symbol we have here gamma ijk is called the Christopher symbol of the second kind now let us take the dot product with the uh, scalar terms such as uh, let us take dot product in both the sides if it is an orthogonal coordinate system this will uh, give you a delta uh if you take a dot product e n here this will give you a delta function so k can be replaced by m therefore the answer you will get is gamma i j m e m dot uh, dou by dou q j of e i so this is the mathematical form of christopher symbol of second kind so christopher symbol actually gives you the connection it is used to give you connection this is the mathematical form of christopher symbol remember this equation is important because we are going to use this a lot in our general relativity uh, course and uh, this uh, connection this symbol is also known as the coefficient of connection 
Uh, now some notes on Christopher symbols. Uh, Christopher symbol I J N is not a third rank tensor or a mixed tensor as I've already said. It is just an array of number which defines a metric connection. Similarly, do VI by do QJ is also not a second rank tensor because EI cannot be equal to EG because we are defining the whole thing in a non-orthonormal uh, coordinate system. This cannot be a second rank tensor. In Cartesian coordinate, the Christopher symbol goes to zero. I have already defined this because they have a symmetry between the metric and the coordinate system. This uh, Cartesian coordinate for all i, j and k, the Christopher symbol goes to zero. The Christopher symbols are symmetric with the lower indices. That is, we can just interchange this i and k and write that as Christopher symbol i, j, k is uh, equal to the Christopher symbol j, i, k. This can be proved over here. We have do by do q, j of e, i. That is the Christopher symbol with an e, m dotted so uh, it can be uh, considered uh, we can just uh, again uh, give value for epsilon i epsilon i is do r by do q i therefore by taking here the value for epsilon i we can just uh, rearrange uh, changing i and j will not uh, change anything because both are in the same coordinate system Therefore, the result we will get is Christopher symbol Ji. Therefore, it won't change much. We can easily replace the lower indices of the Christopher symbol. Now, let us evaluate the Christopher symbol. Christopher symbols can be evaluated expressed as a derivatives of metric tensor. We know that metric tensor Gij Christopher symbols can be actually expressed as derivative, a linear combination of derivatives of metric tensor. Just define Christopher symbol of the first kind as I, J, K. We have defined Christopher symbol of second kind using gamma I, J, K. Now let us define the Christopher symbol of first kind as the square bracket of I, J, comma, K. I j represents the lower indices, k representing the uh, higher indices. So uh, the Christopher symbol I j k uh, can be replaced also. So it is defined such that Christopher symbol I j k is j m k g m k. This is the metric tensor g m k into the second order Christopher symbol that is I uh, gamma I j m. Now, by symmetry, we know that IJ uh, can be replaced. Therefore, a first uh, Christopher symbol of first kind, IJK is equal to that of JIK. And this is also not a third rank tensor. So, Christopher symbol IJK can be written by expanding the second order Christopher symbol gamma IJM using the equation we have just uh, derived that is g m k into e m epsilon m dotted with do by do q j of e i since we have a gamma symbol uh, metric tensor here it is okay to write epsilon k that is this can be combined and we can write it as epsilon k uh, do by do q j of e i. Now let us differentiate g i j. We know that g i j is nothing but the dot product of the basis vectors e i dot e j. Therefore, let us uh, here the differentiation comes in differentiation as products. Therefore, do by do q of g i j will be do by do q k of e i dot e j and with the other term. By comparing it with the product what we have here, here this and this, by comparing it with this, we can write it as i k comma j and also j k comma k. It is also okay to say it is k j comma i. 
and see uh, just that uh, the direction in which it is defined or the combine basis vector comes as separate and this index of this uh, tensor comes as the uh, comes in a combination so it is i k j and j k i so the christopher symbol i j k here see we have a symmetry it comes like this i k comma j and j k comma i so every term we have this k and this is the one which comes in uh, separated now we'll come to this in a short while so here i can write this christopher symbol i j k as this let's see how we can write this we know that uh, if now this is the term do by do q k of g i j is nothing but i k j plus j k i so this can be this symbol here can be written as the uh, linear combination of christopher symbol of first kind as i j k plus k j i similarly to what we have done here here this can be written as j i k plus k i j and what we have here is i k j plus j k i so you can see i j uh, k uh, appears twice here i j k and j i k are essentially equal and other terms get cancelled out so uh, the christopher symbol i j k can be written as half of these terms so we have Uh, define that Christopher symbol I J K N is actually G N K into Christopher symbol of second kind gamma. Therefore, by just uh, replacing, we can write that gamma uh, I J S is the contravariant form of the metric tensor G K S with respect to the uh, multiplied with the Christopher symbol of first kind. therefore this can be expanded and written as gamma ijs is equal to half metric tensor ks into uh, partial derivative of gik partial derivative of gjk minus partial derivative of ggi this equation is also very important while we are learning the kinematics in a uh, riemannian or any other manifolds uh so this uh, comes in handy when we are actually defining uh, what is happening in a relativistic field now let us uh, define a covariant derivatives so far we have seen the metric tensor which connects two different points also a uh, uh, christopher symbols also used to define two different points in a, a different way so let us define a covariant uh, derivative this is also a way of introducing a working connection between uh, the points in a manifold and uh, by this is by means of a differential operator here the connection is done by means of a differential operator this is different from the uh, affine connection which we were talking about in case of christopher symbols in a special case of a manifold uh, which is embedded on a higher dimensional euclidean space such as we have seen uh, just before the covariant derivative can be viewed as a orthogonal projection some projection of the directional derivative into that manifolds tangent space in case of euclidean uh, derivative uh, this uh, euclidean derivative can be broken up into 
two different uh, phases that is an extrinsic space that is a normal component and also an intrinsic space uh, phase that is the uh, covariant component so in case of a manifold here we are discussing uh, see uh, this is a stimulation which you can get from Wolfram Alpha please uh, go to this uh, link I will give it in the description you can find uh, this uh, area is being stimulated you can find the covariant and contravariant uh, sorry covariant uh, derivative the normal tangent derivative here this uh, red here this arrow actually is the covariant derivative and this uh, yellow arrow here is the actual derivative that is normal orthonormal derivative we, uh, which we usually take uh, is here so uh, since uh, this is a space euclidean space uh, this covariant derivative is actually a projection of this derivative and this is our plane and this is our tangent vector to this uh, particular point so you can play with this manifold and its uh, derivatives in this uh, stimulation so please go to this stimulation and find uh, actually experience what is the difference between the uh, derivative actual derivative which we were talking about these all these years and the difference between the covariant derivative so covariant derivative is a way of specifying or uh, uh, the divergence along the tangent vectors of a manifold so covariant derivative a way of introducing a working connection between the manifold by means of a differential operator this is also used for connection Covariant uh, derivative is different from the normal partial derivative because uh, by uh, when we are taking a normal partial derivative we lose a lot of information but if we are taking the covariant derivative of a field then the laws of the physics is uh, somewhat intact so it carries all the laws of a physics from the flat space uh, to a curved space in general relativity so to take this information we use the covariant derivative now let us have a mathematical explanation of a covariant derivative we know that a contravariant vector can be written in terms using uh, these which we have derived just now so a contravariant taking the differential of a contravariant derivative we can write it as dou by dou qg vij can be written once as a linear combination of ei and something as a linear combination of ek now we can interchange the symbols i and k in case of christopher symbols so this term can be replaced by all the i's and uh, eights are replaced because uh, they are obviously the dummy indices dummy indices can be replaced and this ei's can be taken outside and here we have do by do qj plus vi into christopher symbol j i k and this a uh, term which is inside this parenthesis is called the covariant derivative of this contravariant vector vi it is expressed as v semicolon ji the semicolon ji actually tells us that uh, the differentiation is done with respect to qj therefore uh, this uh, combination so here we have the partial derivative actual partial derivative plus some more components so uh, that's why we said that the covariant derivative is can be considered as a projection of the actual derivative so we have this actual uh, derivative here and uh, some other uh, components uh, to form the covariant derivative of this contravariant vector so when we are taking the differential the total differential of uh, dv 
uh, then we can uh, say that it can be written as dou v dash by dou qj into dqj. So taking this into consideration, uh, this uh, property into consideration, we can just uh, multiply it with dqj and we can write it in this form. So the coefficient rule must allow that this term, this contravariant derivative is the ijth component of a mixed second rank tensor because uh, we have here uh, is a, a combination we have here the components we have here a covariant uh, basis vector so this must be a second rank tensor a mixed tensor so the covariant derivative of the contravariant component of a vector is the mixed second rank tensor similarly if we are considering the covariant derivative uh, sorry uh, now in Cartesian coordinate the covariant derivatives actually coincide with the ordinary partial differential equation because we know that in Cartesian coordinate uh, the gamma ijk the Christopher symbol will go to zero and this covariant derivative will be seen as that of uh, the uh, partial derivative we have seen that the covariant derivative of contravariant vector can be written in this form while the covariant derivative of a covariant vector can be written in this form now you know the difference uh, is not obvious in why it is not obvious in the cartesian system because in cartesian system no matter we are taking the covariant derivative or the partial derivative these term goes to zero so that the difference between covariance and the contravariance is not much evident in the Cartesian system. The regular partial derivatives can be replaced by the covariant derivatives to carry the laws of physics from the flat space to the curved space. This actually uh, gives us a basis for what we call as principal equivalence. In principle of equivalence, Einstein actually tells us that when we measure something such as force uh, in one coordinate system will be same as the measurement which is taken in another coordinate system uh, no matter what it, if it is accelerator or if, uh, any uh, type of combination uh, what measurement we take in one field uh, one reference frame will be similar to that of uh, what we take uh, with respect to the other reference frame so we can actually change uh, uh, the systems using this covariant uh, derivatives so that the laws of the physics is carried out intact from one space to another. Now we are moving on to our topic that is geodesic. So geodesic, uh, we have said that we have a lot of way to connect two different points in a manifold. We can either use a metric tensor or Christopher symbol or a covariant derivative. There are many ways in which we can connect two points in a manifold. So, uh, is there a way in such that the connected two points are close to each other or that uh, the fastest way, the, sm uh, uh, the simplest way to connect two points such that uh, the distance between these points are the minimum. Yes, there is a path in which the uh, two points connected are the same, uh, sorry, two points connected shares the minimum distance and such a uh, way path is called a geodesic. So geodesic is a curve of the shortest length between two points in a curved space and it is characterized by a metric tensor. Uh, examples is a straight line in our normal uh, linear space, Euclidean space. Ellipses of a planet is a geodesic. That is, planets take an ellipsoidal way is a geodesic. Free fall of something is a geodesic. We will, uh, we will actually uh, learn about geodesic more intriguing. Mathematical way of learning geodesic will be carried out possibly in two lectures from now also. This 
uh, idea of geodesic is very important while we learn general relativity because this uh, gives us an idea of how particle a non accelerated particle a free fall particle moves through uh, time space so it is a path with a local minimum that is using the variational principle uh, delta integral ds is equal to zero hope you remember we have done this little variational thing in our uh, lagrangian uh, and we have later carried on uh, carried on it to uh, get the equation of hamilton dynamics hope you remember that uh, we have uh, said that the action uh, delta integral ldt must be equal to zero so this is the same so uh, it's a variation it's a path of the local minimum that is it is a path which is taken by a body which is under a free fall so using the Fermat's uh, variational principle this is actually used in optics it can be used over here also uh, delta that is deviation in the path ds must be equal to zero a geodesic equation can be written in this form see here we have this is a second order differential equation second order uh, in space first order in space so this it must be familiar right this is a equation of motion here we have some terms of acceleration some terms of velocities so this geodesic equation actually gives us an idea about how particles moves in a space See, this equation is very, very important because most of the research uh, happening in general relativity is based on this particular equation. How we manipulate this equation for different fields and forces and different kinds of body actually gives us the complete idea of the general relativity. So, geodesics are curves which are independent of the choice of coordinates. Uh, since we are talking about tensors, it is obvious that it is uh, independent of coordinates. So, geodesics are independent of the coordinates. There can be more than one geodesic for a, a particular uh, uh, travel between two points. It is possible to have more than one geodesic. But it is uh, the only thing is that the local, uh, the distance between it should have to be the shortest now let us uh, learn about the parallel transport this also comes as a uh, what uh, as an output of a geodesic so parallel transport actually i see when i transport a vector along a manifold uh, by not varying the vector can transport a vector along a manifold such that the components of the vector as well as its direction remains the same then such a transport is called a parallel transport here i have shown another stimulation from wolfram alpha please uh, go for this stimulation also i will put the link in the description box uh, this will actually show you how the parallel transport of this particular vector is possible see consider a vector over here this is transported along a curve such that this vector will remain the same the components of the vector will remain the same so any curve will not give us that uh, transport only the parallel transport uh, gives us such that the vector remains the same this is also a way of connecting two vectors in the manifold because one can be set parallel to another when it can be obtained through parallel transport so parallel transport through curve is along the covariant uh, this is a curve along which the covariant derivative is zero we know that covariant derivative uh, can be expressed as an orthogonal projection of the normal derivative so this is a part in which the derivative is zero that is the uh, it is transported along the tangent of a vector consider in the normal uh, space 
when we uh, talk about parallel transport in a flat space that is if it is transported parallel this means that it is transported in the same way or it is transported along the tangent of this vector itself this can be this vector can be transported along this way only in parallel transport that it is transported along the tangent of the initial vector so since it is transported along the tangent of the initial vector its covariant derivative goes to zero this uh, taking derivative will give you a zero so parallel transport is transport along the curve in which the covariant derivative is zero that is the transportation happens along the tangent of the vector the parallel transport on a manifold make precise idea about translating a vector field along a differentiable curve to attain a new vector field such that it is parallel to it as said it is also a way of connecting two different vectors or vector field in a manifold the parallel transport or displacement of a covariant vector vk from a point qi to uh, qi plus delta qi can be defined by this equation which is given over here so it is a combination of the christopher symbol and uh, the path along which the uh, displacement is taken place uh, when we shift a vector to its uh, neighboring point parallel transport prevents it from uh, sticking it outside the uh, manifold which we are talking about so all the vector under transformation will uh, be enclosed in our a particular manifold we are talking about only it won't stick to the outer space so geodesic is a curve uh, which is parallelly transported along its tangent vector so uh, if uh, the, uh, if a vector is parallelly transported as well as the distance between it is kept a minimum then it is a geodesic curve the so vector uh is kept parallel to itself and also it is transported uh, along the same direction uh, uh, its components are kept the same it is kept parallel to itself then it uh, goes through a geodesic curve so in this uh we have learned a lot about uh, the manifolds so manifold is something a uh, space uh, which is not that linear which has curves and dips in it that type of a space uh, which is embedded on a higher dimensional space is called a manifold so to access information about manifold we need to create some other spaces which we are already familiar with such as an euclidean space so we uh, uh, we map every point on the manifold to another euclidean space so we call it as a tangent space because the space is oriented along the tangent of that point and now we have defined different ways such as a metric tensor or a christopher symbol a covariant derivative or a geodesic or a parallel transport so that we can connect two points in this manifold so i hope in this lecture is clear to you we have many uh, problems related to this uh, in your textbook hope you'll go through it and if you uh, come across anything uh, stuck across anything you can uh, just message me so uh, for fun just uh, try this as a rich tensor over uh, what i have written here are uh, here this is a ricci tensor and this is a curvature scalar so considering uh, observing this particular equation this is an equation einstein's field equation just uh, evaluate the properties of this ricci tensor you will be surprised to know that the ricci tensor also gives us a lot of information in the general relativity equation also so just uh, give a google search on ricci tensor and see how it this metric tensor mu nu actually 
operates on is to give the curvature of the manifold. So we have several equi uh, uh, it's possible in your both your textbooks in Afghan and Weber and also I have found uh, in your uh, another textbook uh, from HK Das. So uh, go through all these exercises and in HK Das you will find uh, the transformation between the Cartesian and the coordinate, uh, the polar coordinate system and all these transformation taking place over there. It is good exercise to understand the concepts we have studied just now. Uh, so go through all those exercises and get back to me if you are stuck at somewhere. So these are my references. Thank you.